Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this, Skip. It's just a wonderful facility. It's my first time here, actually, since the, the ceremony for the, for the library itself. Uh, it's just a treat to come back to Arkansas. I'm from El Dorado. I grew up there. And uh, just a fabulous state and a fabulous time. I've been, obviously, in South Carolina, as, as Jeremy mentioned, for a few years, for about 10 years now. Love it over there. But uh, any time I can get back, and this actually happens to be a duck hunting trip for me. So I'm actually extra, very, extra excited to be here back uh, for this. But uh, one of the things that um, I've been able to do throughout my career, and one of the, the times that Jeremy touched on, which was one of my most favorite things I did, was I was the executive director of the South Carolina Republican Party. And what was interesting about that was, during that time, I got to sit over basically two presidential debates. One was in Columbia and one was in Myrtle Beach. And what's so fascinating is, is when you're on the backstage side of those things, you get to see all the candidates come through your state. Okay? And because it's a primary state, an early primary state, along with Iowa and uh, New Hampshire, South Carolina plays a big role in the early primary process. And so they're always there. They're always coming into your living rooms. They're always coming to your events. And you get to see them try and trot out and start the beginning of what they want to brand themselves as. Because once they're in the race, everyone else, or even before in a lot of cases, they're trying to get, you're trying to brand the person before they get out of the gate. So one of the examples I used and I, I touched on backstage was Rand Paul. Everyone knows Ron, right? He's got this whole thing about not ever going to war on anything. That's fine. That's his position. He sticks to it. That's good. His son is a little bit different. His son comes to South Carolina just a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, I guess. The day after DOMA comes out of the Supreme Court, the day after Prop 8, and the day after the vote on immigration in the Senate, you come to South Carolina, the reddest of red states, that's the fattest, lowest hanging fruit you could ever wish for. You come there and you can rail on gay marriage and you can rail on immigration and you have that room eaten out of your hand and the red meat's on the ground and they're scratching and clawing to get to it. He didn't mention any of those things one time. Not once. His entire presentation was, I'm not my daddy on foreign policy. Now, I say daddy, not in a derogatory term, from the South. It's mamas and daddies. So I'm not saying like daddy's boy. I'm saying I'm not my daddy on foreign policy. That's what he said. And what's interesting about that is like Arkansas, we have the Air Force Base in Jacksonville. You know, South Carolina has a lot of bases too. We have some down the coast. We have some in Columbia as well. And to come there and your whole presentation be I'm not my daddy on foreign policy tells me he's trying to angle for a different group that his daddy couldn't get wouldn't get and refuse to get. That's fine. But the glaring hole was he didn't touch Prop 8, he didn't touch DOMA, and he didn't touch anything on the social side. That means he is more libertarian than the average conservative. It's fine too. But the fact remains. Now he's created a vacuum for himself because the fact he says, I'm not my daddy on foreign policy means the anti-war part of his father's base is now not going to support Rand. He can't backfill it with social conservatives because he refuses to address social issues. So now he's stuck in kind of a no-man's land. That's, what he, that's why these early branding efforts are so important. He gets to see what works, what's not working. He can take some polls in some of these early states to see where he's sitting so he can adjust and change. I'll never forget, um, and we'll get to the meat of this in just a moment, but one of the first days Rick Perry came on the scene, and he'll be plenty in this presentation, I promise. He's the Texas governor, right? He's the savior, much like Fred Thompson was in 08. He's, he's Texas swag. He comes out, he's good looking, he's got great hair, good tan. He's kind of tough, looks like the Marlboro Man almost, right? He's from Texas, big state, like George Bush. First day he comes to Iowa, Lands in the state, so typical, and he's, got a, he's just got a way about him. He's all over the stage, but it's this over-the-top, you know, first time on the ground, foghorn, leghorn presentation. It's just this, you know, I say, I say. It's just real colloquial. It's just not even, not presidential. It's just too much, too syrupy. 
But there's a poignant moment in his presentation where his wife's on the front row, and it's a stage, and it's time to take the jacket off and give her the jacket, okay? So he looks at his wife, and he says, I want everyone to see my baby girl. There's Anita on the front row. She's the mother of my children. Stand up, Anita. And Anita stands up, and everyone claps for Anita. It's the first time in the state. And he goes, I'm going to give my jacket to my baby girl because it's cold. Now, it's June, but fine. It's cold. <laughs> so he takes his jacket off, hands it to the lady, and everyone's clapping. Now he's walking back, and now his jacket's off. And he stops, and he goes, now I'm a little wrinkled. But it's not because my baby's been falling down the job or nothing. And I was like, what? what? So I'm sitting in the back of the room with all the liberal uh, female reporters. I, I know are feminists from the New York Times and from BuzzFeed and all that. And I'm like, is no one listening to this guy? And I'm taking full credit for this because I went to Ben Smith, who at the time was at Politico. And I said, Ben, did you not hear that? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Rewind your tape. Rewinds his tape and he goes, Oh my gosh. So he does this whole Hillary Clinton iron my shirt deal. The next thing you know, they pull Perry off stage for two weeks and they retool his, his presentation. But these things go to brand the candidate. So he came in with all this swagger and Texas governor, you know, big boy stuff. And then he comes out on the stage and lays a big egg. You get to see what brands work, right? You get to try and build who you are right off the bat. Without any interference, the problem comes when the election heats up and the interference comes. How do you react to that interference? Now, if you're comfortable doing this, I want you to participate. If you're not, that's fine. We're not going to have a policy discussion. I just want to kind of, by show of hands, ask a couple questions. Number one, who in here aligns himself, I'd say, more Democratic than Republican? Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you would say you're more Republican than Democrat. Okay. That's about what I thought it would be. That's good. Now, I'm also going to ask you to shout out, and you can be Republican or Democrat and answer this question. Give me some terms to describe, nice terms please, but they can be truthful terms. I need some terms that you would use to describe the Republican Party. Adjectives, little phrases, something. Just shout them out. Insensitive for Republicans, okay? Sensitive. I knew Alice was going to say that. <laughs> Principled. Good. Tradition. Elitist. Yes. White. Nerdy. Come on. I'm helping you out too much. Business. Business. Good. Money. He said. Family. Yes. Okay. Good. Now, I want some terms for Democrats. Smart. Smart. <laughs> Loyal, okay. Oh, progressive, synonym, but that's accurate, yes. Inclusive, yes. Liberal, weak, okay. I did this at Ole Miss, and the first guy raised his hand and said, pot smoking. <laughs> All right, I'm sure Republicans, I'm sure there are plenty of Republicans who smoke pot too. Um, so I'm getting basically your, cool is one I'll use. I think Democrats are cooler than Republicans. Or I don't know that any of these things actually go to pass policy. But give me some policy positions. Pro-choice. Pro-gay marriage. That was equality, yes. Second Amendment. Second Amendment for Republican, I guess. Okay, good. So... All of these things, I'm sure in this room, you, you guys follow this stuff, so you have a core conviction of what these are, right? You believe in these things. Republicans believe pro-life, pro-gun, pro-marriage. Democrats have an opposite opinion. It's fine, okay? But these particular topics go to really brand the party. So you're aligning yourself with a brand that you can associate with, that you appreciate, that you like. That's how you like to be viewed. You, you kind of follow, this, follow under this umbrella. Now, look, we all know the media will make this much more simplistic than it actually is. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, I I'm Republican, uh, and I'm, I I'm socially um, liberal, but I'm fiscally conservative, right? That makes sense. Some people, people try to split the road down, you know, split the baby, I guess, in half. That makes sense. But it's easier for the media to put in a box, right? It, 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 you're right, you believe these things, you're left, and you believe these things. And it's easier for us as voters to understand that as well. 
nuanced positions, we all have them, and that's where most of us kind of fall. We all have some nuanced positions, and that makes plenty of sense. But it's easier for the press to put them into easier bo simpler boxes, quite frankly, because voters just don't pay that much attention. And it's easier for them to have that. So the media can be complicit in a brand one way or the other. One of the interesting things when you start to look at party brands, too, is who leads the party, okay? Barack Obama, on one hand, cool, progressive, equality. Romney, white, money, family, yes, but those types of things. So a lot of times... The brand the party has established right, can be eroded or undergirded depending on who the nominee is, depending on who the head of the party is. And this goes all the way down. I mean, obviously, branding's different at the congressional level, local level, statewide. You've got to do something different. And nationally, it's got to be done differently as well. But regardless, the media can be complicit in this because, especially nowadays, when anything you say is on, on TV in two seconds, I mean, you know, you can oops yourself right out of an election, which we're about to get to in a second. But, but these brands are what help sell you to the American people, right? And how they view you um, always, always cracks me up. Whenever we sit down with a candidate for the first time and we say, I, I guarantee if I ask Skip Rutherford, Skip, what do you think, how do you think these people look at you? Oh, well, I'm great. I bring in, I bring in great speakers all the time. This is a... This is a I'm from Little Rock, everyone likes me, I'm nice, right? I take him out of the room and I ask you guys, and you're probably, look, let me tell you. A couple times, he brought in this idiot speaker from Ole Miss one time, remember that? He wasn't good, right? So what he views himself as and what you view him as are completely different a lot of times and are, are quite frankly at odds. So when we sit down with candidates, they think they're one way. The public views them as something else. And most people's brands aren't strong enough, self-brands, own brands, aren't strong enough to withstand um, attacks or to withstand just the overwhelming perception of the brand itself, okay? It doesn't help. It makes it worse. It's, it's a perfect storm when you have a candidate talking about two Cadillacs, a car elevator, 47%, right? That doesn't help at all, okay? That being said, um, the parties have a brand for a reason. It's easier, sure, but it also, they want you to gravitate to them. They, they want you to associate the, yourself with them, okay? And so the issues they carry and the persona they, 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 they try and uh, bring forth is the one that they want you to gravitate toward. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to show you some things, uh, some videos I have set up, and I'm going to rush through these fairly quickly so we can have a few times, a few minutes for questions and, an and answers. But... One of the things I want to talk about, too, as it relates to brands, is popular culture. We're not going to get to that yet, but I'm going to tell you. Popular culture plays a huge role in branding. With the, anyone here watch The Daily Show? Anyone here watch Colbert Report? Okay. Saturday Night Live? Okay. When policy positions begin to seep into popular culture, that's a death nail for a lot of folks, if it's bad. Okay, And one of the things that's been so interesting to me is when you look at Obama and Obamacare, now Saturday Night Live is starting to make fun of it. Now Brad Paisley at the uh, Country Music Awards is starting to... Brad Paisley's a big Democrat, too. Voted for Obama, did a concert for him. When people start to use your policy positions and put them into popular culture in that way and mock them that way, I met a guy just recently, and I said, Do you, he, he was helping me move, and I just said, do you watch the news? He said, oh, I follow politics. I said, where do you get most of your political news from? He said, Daily Show. <laughs> that's a comedian show. That's not a, that's not a, I didn't tell him that, but I thought, okay, there it is. And, and the reason I didn't tell him that was it, it wasn't, I didn't want to mock him because that's where a lot of Americans get their news. And it's not news, it's satire. But, but the point's made. If that seeps into that narrative, and your brand becomes damaged in popular culture, it's very difficult to turn it around. I'm going to bring up this one first. And I bet most of you will remember this one. Okay. Now, 
This will bring back some memories for you, Skip. Everyone's going to remember this, or you should. Um, and I'm going to stop it several times, but I want you to watch right off the bat. And I'm going to explain to you some things that you won't know or don't know or haven't ever heard about debate. But let's just start with the opening question, and I want you to watch what George... Just keep your eye on George Bush. You'll all remember this. We have a question right here. Yes, how has the national debt personally affected each of your lives? Now, what did George Bush do right off the bat? Okay. How does that, what does that mean? Better things to do, right? White, elitist, you said, right? There's an African-American woman asking a sitting president a question. And the first thing he does is goes, okay. Does anyone know why he was actually looking at his watch? Hmm. He wanted to know how much time he had, okay. He was worried about time. He thought Clinton was getting more time. He didn't like that, okay. Perfectly, perfectly reasonable. But in your mind, if we can play this out for a moment, the brand is white, elitist, you know, at this point, I think it was this point, he didn't know how much a gallon of milk costs, so he was already kind of behind the eight ball in that descriptor. And the first thing he does out of the box when an African-American woman asks him a question, he goes, yeah, I got other stuff going on. That's how it looked. That's not what happened, but that's how it looked. Now watch her ask the question and watch his response. And if it hasn't, how can you honestly find a cure for the economic problems of the common people if you have no experience in what's ailing them? Okay, we're not going to go to Perot. We're going to go back to Bush. The question is bogus on its face because if you couldn't pass policy because you hadn't personally affect, been, been touched by the policy itself, no governor could pass a policy. If their kids go to public school or private school, they couldn't pass a public school piece of legislation. So that's just a bogus question. Not to mention, in fact, it meanders quite a bit. Now, in a debate, this debate in particular, both people who have my job and who've had Alice's job, we argue rules of the debate. You've got to argue podium height, okay? You've got to argue how far apart they can be from each other. They're all little types of things. You can't show, if Alice is answering a question, they can't show my face, okay? We, we, we argue these little nuances with producers way before these debates even get set. So, he's about to start answering the question, and the moderator lets the questioner interrupt him twice. Okay, so any, any chance he has at answering this question halfway decently has gone out the window, right off the bat. Well, I think the national debt affects everybody. Uh, obviously, it has, has a lot to do with interest rates. It has... She's you, saying you personally. You, on a personal basis, how has it affected you? Has it affected you personally? Well, I'm sure it has. I love my grand grandchildren. I want to think how? that... I want to think, think that... How, she asks him. How? Okay. Now, I have no problem with her being able to follow up on the question. The problem is, that's not the rule of this debate, and the moderator allows it. That's the moderator's fault. Now, again, a sitting president should be better at answering this, but we're talking about here the brand that he has. He's the president, he's a Bush, he's elitist, he's money, he's white, he doesn't know the price of a gallon of milk, and he gets asked a question from an African-American woman, and once she interrupts him twice, it's on, because now he's going to start badgering her. They're going to be able to afford an education. I think that that's an important part of being a parent. I, if the question, if you're, you question, wait, if the question is, let's just go back and talk about the question for a second. You're, maybe I won't get it wrong. Are you suggesting that if somebody has means, that the national debt doesn't affect them? Oh, well, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm not sure I get it. Help me with the question, understand. and I'll well, try to answer it. I've had friends that have been laid off from jobs. Yeah. I know people who cannot afford to pay the mortgage on their homes, their car payment. I have personal yeah. uh, problems with the national debt, but how has it affected you? And if you have no experience in it, how can you help us if you don't know what we're feeling? I think she means more the recession, um, the economic problems today the country faces. Well, rather now he's also behind the eight ball here for this reason. He got the question first, okay? Clinton's over there just going, I am going to run this show as soon as this guy gets done. And he badges, he bumbles his Listen, head. You ought, to, you ought to be in the White House for a day and yeah, hear yeah. what I hear. You ought to be, I just got done saying I got affected by the national debt. He's like, you ought to be in the White House for a day. 
yeah, I'd love that. I'd love to call anybody and say, hey, can you just get me a pizza now? And they bring it to you immediately. I'd love a cup of coffee now. She's just telling him how she's affected by the national debt. White, elitist, okay? He's not paying attention to what she's talking about. Here and see what I see and read the mail I read and touch the people that I touch from time to time. I was in the Lomax AME church. It's a black church just outside of Washington, D.C. And I read in the, uh, in the bulletin about teenage pregnancies, about the difficulty that families are having to meet ends, make ends meet. I talk to parents. I mean, you've got to care. Everybody cares if people aren't doing well. But Did anyone believe him when he says you got to care? I mean, okay, I, I'm sure he cares. That's not the point. I'm, I'm trying to explain to you the brand here is not good for this guy. And what he's going to say here undercut or undergirds the bad narrative. That, that he is uncaring, that he doesn't get people, that he doesn't know how much milk costs. Here's a woman talking about it. You should be in the White House. I don't understand your question. It's all messed up, okay? But I don't think, it, I don't think it's fair to say you haven't had cancer, now therefore you don't know what fair. it's like. I don't think it's fair to say, uh, you know, whatever it is, if you haven't been hit by it personally, but everybody's affected by the debt because of the tremendous interest that goes into paying on that debt Everything's more expensive. Everything comes out of your pocket and my pocket. So it's, it's that. But I think in turn... It took him that long, two minutes, to say something about her. Right? The whole time he's talking about me. Now the question was about him. Clinton's not going to care about that, by the way. But he immediately takes it to him. Okay? There's a recession. Of course you feel it when you're president of the United States. And that's why I'm trying to do something about it. By stimulating the export, investing more. Better education. Stimulating the export and investing more education. Clinton says the same three things. Same three things. Okay? Just watch the start of his versus, versus Bush. System. Thank you. Okay. Now, another rule before I get going, and I'm going to just do this because I'm going to step, may I step away from this? Okay. There was a rule in this debate you couldn't walk past a, per, a certain point, right? Bush is just, you know, paying attention to the rules. He's doing whatever. Clinton's just all like, all right. <laughs> so Bill Clinton, so good at that. And he understood it. Huckabee was the same way, right? Because they understood people. They came from kind of a similar place. So while Bush didn't, Clinton comes from a different place. And notice the question. He asks her a question. While Bush starts with me, watch what Clinton says. I have to clarify. Tell me how it's affected you again. Walks right up. Um. You know people who lost their well, jobs, yeah. lost their homes? Uh -huh. Well, I've been governor of a small state for 12 years. I'll tell you how it's affected me. Every year, Congress and the President sign laws that makes us, make us do more things, and gives us less money to do it with. I see people in my state, middle class people, their taxes have gone up in Washington and their services have gone down. Right off the bat, slides right up to her, says, how has it affected you? How has it affected you again? She says it. And his answer, which is absolutely brilliant, but it parallels hers, which is, pre this president makes me pa do, tries to make Arkansas do stuff all the time. We don't have money for that. You've got to buy food. I don't, you don't have money for that. It's this president's fault is basically what he's saying. And he does it so calmly and so smoothly. And again, he had the benefit of having the question second. But this is the brand we just talked about, caring, right? Cool, right? Right up to her. While the wealthy have gotten tax cuts. Wealthy. I, I have seen what's happened in this last four years. When In my state, when people lose their jobs, there's a good chance I'll know them by their names. Right. When a factory closes, I know the people who ran it. When the businesses go bankrupt, I know them. And I've been out here for 13 months, meeting in meetings just like this, ever since October, with people like you all over America. People that have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, lost their health insurance. Mm -hmm. What I want you to understand is the national debt is not the only cause of that. It is because America has not invested in its people. It is because we have not grown. It is because we've had 12 years of trickle-down economics. We've gone from first to 12th in the world in wages. We've had four years where we produced no private sector jobs. Most people are working harder for less money than they were making. And then they show this guy again. So in his one time, he could have at least been like, yeah, that's right. He's like... What is this guy talking about? Right? He completely botches this. 
But again, it's illegal. You weren't supposed to show him, but that's... Ten years ago. It is because we are in the grip of a failed economic theory. And this decision you're about to make better be about what kind of economic theory you want. Not just things. people saying, I'm going to go fix it, but what are we going to do? What I think we have to do is invest in American jobs, American education, control American health care costs, and bring the American people together again. Boom. Same thing, right? Basically the same answer. But can you see the difference? I remember Huckabee, um, and I think it was in, um, I guess it was President in 08, I think. Alice, you probably remember this. There was a time when Romney, there was a question about health care, and a woman stood up and she's crying and she says, my, 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 my kid has a brain tumor. How are you going to, how, how can the government help me? I can't afford coverage. And Romney just pops right up and goes, well, number one, I do this. And number two, I do this. And number three, I do that. Huckabee gets up and walks over and is like, I don't even know, I don't even, I don't know what would happen if the doctor told me one of my children had a brain tumor. I, I've got no words for you. I, I'm, my heart goes out to you. I, you know, when Janet and I got married, she had a spinal tumor, and they said she'd never walk again, never have children. We have three kids, and she jumps out of planes and tags bears, and, and so I can say there's hope for you, but I don't know if government is the answer for your situation, but, but, but some form of health care is, and I'm going to tell you, if I were present, I would do these things. Basically, it gets to the same point, but one comes off like he cares and knows what, you know, is trying to understand what you're coping with, one doesn't. One took the mean, nasty, white, elitist brand and spit on it and said, that's not me, right? Bush completely undergirded the negative side of that narrative, the negative side of the Republican brand. Now, I'm also going to do this little famous gem. Now, in addition to the 47% comment, which is one of those things that really went to, to hurt Romney's campaign, before I get to Romney, real quickly, give me some descriptors for Barack Obama. Just give me any of them. Come on. Intelligent. Good speaker. Yes. More caring. Yes, he does. Family man. Elitist. Okay. Give me a Republican. Give me for Mitt Romney. Out of touch. Wealthy. Yeah. Hmm? Fake. Yeah. I mean, we hit him forever for being a flip flopper for two cycles. So I don't know why that wouldn't, you know. Of course he was fake. But it, that's not the point. So. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. All right. There are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and the government should give it to them. What makes this so interesting? Not just 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. Not just the 47% comment, but it's grainy video. It's from a camera phone. It's in the back of a room. So it looks even more salacious than it actually is. Okay? But Romney at this point, he was already elitist. He was already uncaring. Okay? 47% want this pff, basically writing off the rest of the country, half the country in the, in the comment. So his brand is already bad at this point. We've already had the two Cadillacs. We've already had he's got a car elevator. And the, the best part about the two Cadillacs was the explanation, which made it worse. Well, when we're in our California home, she has a Cadillac. When we go back to Massachusetts, she has one there, too. That's worse. Okay, that didn't help at all, right? I mean, that's way worse. Now, as uh, one of the things I mentioned about Romney, I'm trying to wrap up so we have some questions here, but one of the things I mentioned about Romney was, too, the media can be complicit in this. Now, I want you to pay attention to what the media says, but I want you just to pay attention to this clip, and I'm sure some of you remember this, too. Maybe. Oh, I'm going to have to listen to an ad from LL Cool J, I think. Hold on. Maybe. When an American manufacturer determined to grow, works with a team... Anyway, so... <clears throat> Coming in and out of this, you're going to see some commentary from the media that makes th this clip and the next one I'm about to play show exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm not railing liberal media here, okay? When you are... When you run for president, or you run for governor, whatever, whatever else, the media is the media. 
I do think the, liberal, the media is liberal. I used to be a member of the, of the media. But that's not the point. You know that going in. So complaining about it doesn't do you any good. Okay? You're going to have to buck up and run your own campaign and be a little bit tough if you're going to you know, take that. Huckabee always would say that, you know, that politics is a blood sport. If you hate seeing the, the side of your own blood, you shouldn't be in it. Well, the media is not going to do you any favors. And they're sure not going to do you any favors if you're walking around doing 47%. But this right here is an interesting, interesting clip, and I want to compare the two. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains' majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, Ooh. God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good well, listen to what the media says coming out of this Priceless. from sea to shining sea Whoa. and you thought the star spangled banner was tough to sing Mitt romney they're seeing america the beautiful at a campaign rally in florida last night uh, scott brown told us earlier that he probably shouldn't think about going for american idol okay um, okay so he sings america the beautiful and look anybody singing at the top of their lungs a patriotic song should be sweet i think that's great he's saying it right but this doesn't go to help the brand he's already created for himself, okay? He's already a nerd. Nobody likes him. His genes are up to here. He's saying goofy stuff. He's talking about 47%. So he goes to sing a song which he thought, I'm sure, was going to be effective to people. It was. Until you see this song. Let's the media comment on this. All right, sticking with politics, last night, President Obama was in New York raising money for his own campaign, including a stop at Harlem's famous Apollo Theater. Yeah, being on that stage he seems to have inspired the president. Uh... <laughs> so in love with you. <laughs> the the press sounded good. Good to have some president. Yeah. Okay, so we have Mitt Romney walking around doing his whole little weird walk and his whole little way. And does anyone notice how much of the song did Romney sing? All of it. Barack Obama knows he can't sing that whole song. He sang the two parts he's been singing in the shower since that song came out. Right? He knew exactly what to do there. And again, this is a huge part of brand management. It's brand awareness. Obama knows who he is. Okay? He knows he's cool. He knows if he sings a couple bars of this song, the people are going to swoon in that audience. It's teed up for him. Romney's the complete opposite. He had no idea that singing this song wouldn't be a wonderful thing. Besides the fact it was out of tune, he couldn't sing the tune right. Okay? He just didn't understand who he was or how people perceived him. And that's a big, big problem with candidates. Now I'm going to go... Uh, The one good Republican clip I think I'm going to show you. <clears throat> this was a time during the presidential campaign with Bush and Gore. Now look, it's not just Republicans who always put up nerds, okay? John Kerry was a nerd. Al Gore was a nerd, okay? And I don't mean coolness wins you the election, but it definitely doesn't hurt. It helps quite a bit. And at this point in time, Bush, he had some swagger to him. He was kind of the man in the room. Gore's taller physically, but didn't matter. Listen to Bush's answer here. And, and the brand at this point was a Texas governor who could get it done, who was going to take this country back, and he was a compassionate conservative. You remember that too, okay? Clinton labeled himself the comeback kid. Everybody loves an underdog. I went to Ole Miss. I sure love underdogs. Arkansas, Arkansas fans, you love underdogs. Come on, right? So we get that about someone like Bill Clinton. He was a comeback kid. Bush was the compassionate conservative. He already had the base, so his brand was already strong with the base. He's trying to get other people. Listen to his answer, and, then you'll, and if you remember this, it's just classic. Watch Gore step to him, and watch Bush just put him right in his place. I specifically would like to know whether Governor Bush will support the Dingle Norwood bill, which is the main one pending. Governor Bush, you may answer that if you'd like, but also I'd like to know how you see the differences between the two of you, and we need to move on. Well, the difference is, is that I can get it done. The, the, the difference is I can get it done. What do you mean, what's the difference? 
This guy's nothing. I can get it done. He can't do it. All he does is talk. Didn't answer the question at all. Is not going to talk specific policy at all. That's not the point. He doesn't have to. Because guess what? I don't care what the policy is. I can get it done. That's my brand. And everyone goes, yeah, he can get it done. Now watch Gore come up and try and say, but what about the bill? And Bush just destroys it with just a simple glance. I can get something positive done on behalf of the people. That's what the question in this campaign is about. It's not only what's your philosophy and what's your position on issues, but can you get things done? <laughs> and I believe I can. I mean, how cool is that? And everybody knows what that look means, right? I got this. He completely had control of that moment. And the reason he had control about the moment, not just because he was comfortable with who he was, but he knew his brand, and his brand was good. His brand was get it done. And Al Gore, and, this, and look at that face, ah, oh, it's brutal. And Al Gore's a nice guy, I'm sure. That's not the point. All these people are nice. They all have families. They all, you know, working hard for one goal here. I get it. But what they do with this, what they do with branding is you can completely erode a brand with one moment. You can completely build a brand or turn the corner with one moment, okay? It's the old adage, you can never lose, never win the presidency with a debate, but you can lose the presidency with a debate, okay? And the last example I'm going to show you, and I'm going to kind of close and open for Q&A in a bit, this is, the, this is the losing moment of a floundering campaign already, and it goes to talk about the brand I was talking to you before about Rick Perry. In control of everything. He's Texas, right? It's the biggest state. We got oil. We're Texas, okay? About can you work with Democrats or can you work with Republicans? Yeah, we can all do that. But the fact of the matter is we better have a plan in place that Americans can get their hands around. And that's the reason my flat tax is the only one of all the folks, these good folks on the stage, it balances the budget in 2020. It does the things to the regulatory climate that has to happen. And I will tell you, it's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> oh, five. Okay. So, commerce, education, and uh, the um, um, uh, EPA. EPA. There you go. No, okay. Let's stop. Let's stop. Get Seriously? Um, is EPA the one? And, John, and everyone laughed at the EPA and thought that, that if it had ended there, it would have been fine. But Harwood actually did a good job here. And he says, Seriously? Like, I need to know the third thing you're going to cut here. And he's got nothing. You can see him reaching for it, and it's happened to everybody. You see him reaching for it. What you were talking about? Or? No, sir. No, sir. We were talking about the um, agencies of government. EPA needs to be rebuilt. But you no can't, doubt about but you that. But you can't name the third one? The third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> commerce. I, I, commerce. And let's see. It says no. I can't. The third. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Oops. That effectively sank his campaign. But, but a lot of things sank his campaign, but that was one of them. But what's interesting about that is, as I mentioned to you before, he had that brand. He was going to kind of be the savior. And when he couldn't pull out three things, major policy. Now, you saw Ron Rand, Paul say, five, five, it's five, because he wants government destroyed. I mean, he wants someone to throw a Molotov cocktail on Congress, but that's what he wants. So he's trying to say five, and, and, and Perry does his, no, I, I got my three, and he can't remember the three things. Three. Now, here's the thing. We've all been there. I, I, I've been on MSNBC and forget mid-sentence what I'm saying. It happens to everybody. But keep in mind, no stage is bigger and no lights burn hotter than the ones on the presidential. So a lot of these guys out here, and, and, and Democrats have a deep bench, Republicans have a deep bench. They do till they step on that presidential stage. And then it's a whole nother ball game, and it's difficult to not wilt under those hot lights. Okay? Um, I'm going to show you one ad, I think, from our... Okay, our firm, 
um, Brabender Cox is the firm I work for, and we do everything from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, we do, does anyone know who Ben Roethlisberger is? Raise your hand. Remember when he got into a little trouble then in Georgia? We handled that. Um, he, uh, we do Blue Cross Blue Shield all over the country, a lot of places. We do political candidates all over the country. And so, again, one of the things that we always try to do is, is to identify that brand early on and try and either change it or undergird the parts we like. One of the things that, um, and I'm going to try to get, I'm going to have to fast forward a little bit, but one of the things um, that I did, and I'm going to show you two ads to end on, and um, if I, maybe. Not that one. I'm Rick Santorum, and I approve this no, message. I okay, I will show that ad. This was an ad when Rick Santorum started doing really well in the presidential, and we started winning. I got lots of calls, and this shows you the brand that Romney carried at the time amongst the media, not the public, but amongst the media. As soon as we did well, I got texts and emails from people all over the country that said, congratulations, are you ready for the Romney, are you ready for the Romney Death Star? The attacks are coming. And that meant what happened was, if you remember, everybody pinged themselves off Romney. Everyone would rise up and Romney would just unleash on those people. And then they'd end up falling, falling by the wayside. We knew that was coming. And we had little or no money. So we went out and hired an actor that looked like Mitt Romney. Uh, we put together this little spot called Rombo, which is like Rambo. And um, thought it was really effective because it went to the point that we were trying to say of undergirding Romney as mean, money, nasty. He attacks everybody. Don't fall for him. And so this is the ad, and I'll show you two more. The negative attack machine is back on full throttle. This time, Romney's firing his mud at Rick Santorum. Romney and his super PAC have spent a staggering 20 million brutally attacking fellow Republicans. Why? Because Romney's trying to hide from his big government Romney care and his support for job-killing cap-and-trade. And in the end, Mitt Romney's ugly attacks are going to backfire. Similar to the ad, quite frankly, that Huckabee ran against Jimmy Lou Fisher with the, the, um, the four-wheeler ad, right? Very similar in this concept was, sh she's going to attack, he's going to attack, that's who he is. So we went to undergird and play up the nasty side of Mitt Romney. Now, I'm just going to show you a couple more because they're Obama-related. And um, I'm going to fast forward, sorry that these are... I'm Tom Coburn, and I... No, not Tom Coburn. You are, but... I'm Dan Honorado, the Democrat for governor. Are you as angry as I am? I'm Dan Honorado, the... Yeah, you are. You are Dan Honorado. Dan Honorado. Yeah, he was. I'm the president. Okay. I'm going to play this ad because this is one of the things, and I'll stop and open for questions. One of the things Obama did, I was at the um, DNC um, uh, convention or Democrat National Convention in Charlotte. I was doing some stuff for MSNBC and it was electric. I mean, they were jazzed up for a second term for this guy. It was really impressive. And one of the things he did was, has anyone seen the movie The American President with Michael Douglas? Okay. Has anyone seen the movie Clear and Present Danger with Harrison Ford? Remember the scene in, in the White House after Harrison Ford basically busted out the president for doing this covert operation and, and the President's, you know, president looks at Harrison Ford and says, you know, how dare you bark at me? I'm not some junkyard dog. I'm the president of the United States. And in the movie, Michael Douglas says, in that poignant campaign moment where he's taking on Bob Rumson for making fun of his personal life, and he says, I'm the president of the United States. I am the president, Bob. And everyone, it's a, it's a big moment where you're, you are the president at this point. You've taken control of this country. You've taken control of the office. We won an award for this particular ad, and I remember watching the president's speech, and he had that moment, and he said, I'm the president, and everyone went ballistic, and it was so electric. And I looked at that, and I thought, you know, this guy really is taking a lot of credit for the, for the things he's done well, but he's not taking credit for being the president on some things. So I called my boss up. We had this conversation, and this is the ad he came up with, and it didn't run nationally. It ran in, it was the Pittsburgh GOP that bought it played the ad, but I just want to show it to you guys to show you the brand, the brand management of the ad itself, I think. President. I'm the 
President. I'm the President. I'm the President. Paid for by the Republican Federal Committee of Pennsylvania, not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. I love that ad. So basically we said, you're the president, that's right. And you're the president of all these bad things too. Because at that point, he'd done a pretty good job of st sticking clean and actually still does, quite frankly. But regardless, um, and I'll end with this, it's difficult, it's difficult, it's difficult to create brands in general. Um, and it's definitely difficult when your candidate thinks he's one thing or she's one thing and people view them as something else. But it can be done. But pay attention to these political speakers now as we get ready to go into 2016. Watch what they're saying now and watch how that changes in the next couple of weeks and months. Because the brand you see now is not going to be the brand. The Rick Perry take off my coat to my baby girl is not the same brand you saw when he started hitting somewhat of a stride before he oopsed himself right out of the race. So while brand management is tricky, and developing brands is probably even trickier, um, keep an eye on it because it really is fascinating stuff. You guys wouldn't be here if you didn't pay attention to politics to some degree. But to watch Rand Paul come to South Carolina and say not one thing about any social issue or one thing about immigration but to focus on war, tells you he's trying to create a brand for himself that polling shows he doesn't currently have, okay? When you see the old white elitist Republican do something that's old white and elitist Republican, it doesn't help. When you see Barack Obama sing Al Green, that helps. I'm a Republican, I, I saw that and I thought, we just lost that election. Not because the song's good, because he did a good job doing it. But as we move forward into the presidential, because Little Rock obviously has a special place in presidential politics, um, you guys will have a heated Senate race. You guys will have uh, some heated congressional races. The governor's race is going to be a show. But at any level, regardless, watch the brands, because it's very fascinating that things that you think they are, the things they actually are, and the things that they try to portray themselves as. It changes from start, the start of a campaign to the end of a campaign. Pay attention to the Republican brands that you guys just told me about. The Republicans in the room, raise your hand one more time, or Republican-leaning people in the room. The brands we just talked about, the ones that we got beat over the head with, beaten senseless with in the last election, see if the nominee changes that. The Democrats in the room, your brand's okay right now. See what happens when you put up someone that, that 47 percents themselves, oops themselves, you know, messes themselves over and isn't able to recover from it. It's just fascinating stuff. But anyway. Check one, two. Let me try this one. It's cold. It's cold. That's the bad thing about the winter. governor's office, Mary Dale, he didn't wear socks. I did not. I do not. Before we go to questions, give, give a minor or just a short sure. your analysis of the current brand of Chris Christie and Hillary Clinton. Hmm. Just your analysis of the current brand right now. I realize it would be just a... No, Hillary's got one of the best brands in the country. The Clinton name is a really good brand right now. Um, and it stands for peace and prosperity. It stands for equality. It stands for all the things that, that Democrats hold near and dear to their hearts, at least at this moment. Um, is that fair, deserved? That's never the issue. The fact is it's already there. Um, but but I'll, I'll say about Chris Christie, and I got asked this the other day, Christie is bawdy, right? Everyone knows him as kind of a tough guy from New Jersey. Well, I, Camden, New Jersey is not Camden, South Carolina. And he will come try that act on somebody, and it will not play well there because it will come across as rude and it will come across as mean. And when he's hammering the president, he's hammering the media, all of us are like, great, they need to be hammered for that. 
But then some little old lady is going to ask a question who's going to be like his precinct captain in Richland County in South Carolina, and he's going to jump all over them like stink on a monkey. And the next thing you know, that poor lady's going to be crying, and now he's just big and nasty, and he's a bully. I mean, he's already called out Meghan McCain in an argument recently. He's calling out Rand Paul, calling him names already. Speaking, after, and worked for Rick Santorum, a guy who f felt like he could hit and would swing at every pitch. You, you, it's a, from now until 2016, you're going to have to let a few hit the dirt. You're going to have to let a few go by because when you start hitting Iowa, South Carolina, and New Hampshire, it, his, his attitude will come across as petty and he'll come across as thin-skinned, and that's not going to be a good combination for him. That's just my opinion about Christie. Hogan's not saying this, but that sounds like an opening for Mike Huckabee for me, but that's me saying that for Hogan. I'll say not, that too. Okay. I, I, I will put Hogan in that spot. Okay, now questions. Yes, Mayor. Hi, my name is Mayor D'Amico. I'm a second year student here at the Clinton School, and I really enjoyed your presentation today. I was wondering if you've ever worked with female political candidates and what particular challenges you face um, with branding for female candidates. Sure, I have many times. Um, it's always more difficult, and it's not because I'm a man, I don't understand anything about women. It's because just the, the inherent difference in the two. If, if you attack a woman, it's um, you're mean. If the woman attacks, she's a witch with a capital B. So it, it's, it's difficult to navigate those waters. But now, um, it's gotten a little bit better, I think, uh, quite frankly, from a, from a standpoint is if, if you're going to run for, if you're a female and you're going to run for office, you're going to have to take some, you're going to have to take a different level of jabs now. Hillary's going to have to take a different level of jabs now that she didn't have to take in 2008, right? Um, and that should, I think that should be the way it is, quite frankly. If you're going to run, you should be able to take it, but you should be able to dish it out, too. And that's something, a, a corner we're going to have to try and change. But that's, running a female's campaign is much more difficult um, than a male's. And, and quite frankly, the spouse can play a, a significant role in that as well. I mean, who, who would not, rather, the, the first spouse being Bill Clinton, give me a break. That's a great first spouse to have, you know. Okay. Here comes the microphone right behind you. Uh, first of all, thank you for visiting us today. Sure, man. Uh, my name is Ramirez Biddle. I'm a class nine student here at the Clinton School, and uh, you brought up El Dorado. I'm from Magnolia, so hey. there you go. Um, my, I have a cousin that's in the Arkansas State Legislature, and he would really want me to run after he turns out in his district. But it's a minority, it's a majority minority district, and minorities have a problem winning bigger office, for instance, Senate because it had a stigma of saying, okay, you're only a minority candidate for minority issues. And so I chose to want to run in a different district. How can I brand myself that's more appealing to working class whites uh, because black candidates have a problem with sure. identifying with working class sure. whites? Um, Bill, uh, Mike Huckabee's the only Republican in history who's won 50% of the black vote in a statewide election. He did it twice because he goes and talks to people in African-American districts and says, hey, what do we need to do? Let, let's have a conversation. Let's figure something out. That's when it's really not. Um, and I'm not accusing you of that. Afterwards, too. Um, you need to go into their community. You got to be, a, you know, you're not afraid to go into any community. We need to figure out, you know, you, you're running as a representative or a state senator to represent everybody, not just a segmented population. So you've got to show them you understand their issues, and you've got to, under, you've got to show them you're willing to talk to them about their issues in a way they understand and say, look, I'm here, I'm going to represent you. So your voice needs to come through me. That's how you got to do it. And we, we can do specifics after this is over, for sure. But yeah. I'm Matia Fleischner, the Clinton School of Students, hi. and um, hi. Uh, hi, thank you for being here. Sure. Um, I had a question concerning Fox News. I noticed that you didn't bring it up during your um, report of different media outlets, which, you, you know, there are several media outlets, but I, their role in the last campaign, especially during the finals of elections, they seem very lost um, in a time when it was a defined moment for many me media outlets. Um, how do you think they will change in the upcoming election? to be a more um, respected, maybe, institution. Lost how? 
as far as that kind of at the, at the end of the elections, they weren't sure who won. Uh, so they were going into the different... The, yeah. Uh, no, well, part of that is, first of all, it's, it, polls show it's the most trusted name in news. So that's, a, that's not quite the assertion. I, again, that's the brand they have, but polls show the exact opposite, that they're actually very trusted. But that's an issue where you're talk, probably talking about Karl Rove doing his... I'm referring to during the end of elections, they weren't sure who won, so they went to the actual um, election uh, poll to see who won. Yeah. And they found out that it was Romney had won, had won, and they went to the room to check on it. Right. Well, I think a lot of the things is when the pundits you have on are pro one side or the other, they're going to be more apt to say it, say, say it ain't so. No, that can't be right. And that happens on the, I mean, look, I was at MSNBC on election night doing overnights from midnight to five. And when they called the election for Obama, the whole floor erupted in applause, the whole floor. Now I wasn't in an anchor room, so I didn't see if an anchor did that or not, but I know some of the anchors personally and very well, and I know they were cheering too. So it happens everywhere. I understand the Fox News bent, but I mean, again, they're kind of a trusted name. But when you have pundits who are one way or the other, they're going to be the ones driving that conversation. That can't be right because back in this year we did it this way. And that goes to a bigger systemic problem with the Republican Party right now is we're completely, our, our get out the vote method is completely antiquated and so is our um, turnout mechanism, uh, get out the vote, but also voter identification. The, the, the stat that blew, that blew my mind, George H.W. H. Bush won 67%, 64% of the white vote and he won a landslide election, okay? Mitt Romney won the same amount and got trounced. So that shows a complete lack of understanding of the electorate and or the shifting, uh, the changing tide in the electorate as well. You know, in fairness, Hogan, we'll get, uh, on, on election night, Fox News did overrule Karl Rove. They did. I mean, I mean they the did. Fox, and, and it, that's what made Karl Rove mad was that, right. that his producers and and Megyn Kelly, went, they went down the hall. Like yeah. Megan's like, nope, come on, we're going down the hall. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that Fox did say, no, Carl, with the highest respect, you've called this one wrong. That's right. All right, Ms. Abrams. Using an old model. Right, here, now, here comes your tough question, Carl. Uh, uh, this, okay. this is Andy Abrams. She's okay. the Helen Thomas of the Clinton School. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> In Arkansas, we have usually let the candidates decide they wanted to bear the party. This year, with this being painted a red state and a blue state, if I was interested in running for a position, you know the brand of the Republican Party. You know the brand of the blue, the blue state. How would you if I hired you, help me to either disown the brand of my party or to embrace it. Are you going to run? I got a business card up here. You can well, I, I'll take it. Sign a contract I, I right run here? candidates. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I ask that is because I think both parties are looking for candidates. They are. Should the candidate be trying to be the image of the party, or should they be knowing what they know about the party, brand themselves, and stay with that brand based on that research? Part of that depends on sincerity in the candidate and what you want to accomplish. One of my favorite Huckabeeisms, and I'm prone to quoting him, is I'm a Republican, I'm just not mad at everybody about it. Okay? So when he would go out and talk to, um, stereotypically Democrat groups or, you know, consolidation efforts, which we knew had, you know, Democrat teachers who did not like his, just talking to people and listening to people goes so far in establishing a brand for you and for flying in the face of one. You saw Bill Clinton walk up and just say, how has it affected you again, right? Bush just started talking about himself. Be as selfless as you know how to be. If this is you, if it's not, run on something else, right? The Ted Cruz of the world run on a different different deal. If you believe that and you want to govern all the people, as I mentioned to him, then do it. Well, it, right. 
through brilliant advertising, of course. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Through, you, you, you can do it, but it doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes some of that hard work. I mean, that's what makes, that's what makes Iowa and, and New Hampshire and South Carolina interesting, because someone like Huckabee can be outspent 20 to 1 and still win Iowa by 9 points, or someone like Santorum, we spent $30,000 and still beat Romney, because what, he was, what they were were antithetical to what the brand already was, okay? They undergirded the parts they wanted to undergird, and then they flew in the face of the ones that weren't, so they made news for that, okay? But they were sincere when they did it. Some people are just spouting out rhetoric and saying things, you know, just to get elected. If you truly believe these things, you got to roll up your sleeves and you got to hit every corner and every coffee shop all around that district, all around the state, and try to explain them how you're different and how you're going to get things accomplished. When, when you're, you're Huckabee and you've got 87% Democrat legislature, and you, but you get 92% of your package through every year, you're working with somebody, okay? So it's not just you have to say you're going to work with somebody, you have to do it, right? You have to go into those communities nonstop, not just in election years, okay? Huckabee preached in, in black churches, not in October. He did it all the time, not in October of, a, of an, all, uh, you know, an election year. It's all the time. But he also, you know, he, he, he governed in a way that was inclusive, and we, you know, we need more inc inclusiveness, I think. Correct, yes. I'm, correct. I might add that Mike Huckabee was the governor that provided the initial funding for the Clinton School in the spirit of bipartisanship, which we greatly appreciate. And I'll tell you, I don't know which Republican candidate will get uh, Hogan Gidley on her or his bandwagon in 2016, but you can see that he knows his stuff and he's one of the brightest young political operatives in the country. Let's thank Hogan Gidley. Thank you.